turn to the most important chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And I want to talk about the fall of man or the greatest tragedy in human history because what happened here affects you and me today and every generation in the future. This is so important. Every word is full of meaning. And I want you to notice carefully every word as we read today. And uh, I'll keep time and we'll be out of here shortly. I asked somebody one day, how long am I supposed to preach? I was just kidding with them. They said, well, you can preach as long as you want to. But we're going to eat at 1230. <laughs> this crowd loves to eat. I said, if we ever have a theme song, it should be, God be with you until we eat again. <laughs> and church people and Baptist people are known for loving to eat. One time in the third grade in school, the teachers said to the kids, now tomorrow I want you to bring uh, a symbol of your religion, uh, whatever kind of religion you have. Uh, there, there's some kind of... Uh, uh, thing that would represent your religion, I'm sure. And the next day, the Muslim boy brought a prayer rug, and the Catholic girl brought a string of rosary beads, and the Baptist boy brought a casserole dish. <laughs> so if you like to eat, you're person after my own stomach, and so uh, <laughs> Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 and read, and I want you to listen to every word that is recorded here, because uh, uh, in the first few chapters of Genesis, the book of beginnings, God covers a lot of space in just a few verses, so every word is important. In fact, half of the Bible time is in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. The 4,000 years of time that the Bible covers, about 2,500 years of it is taken up in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So we're covering a lot of time real fast. And so listen carefully. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto the Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? 
And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And there's a lot more, but we're going to let that suffice. Let's all stand for just a moment of prayer, and pray with me, pray for me, as we study this important chapter. And uh, I hope that you'll realize how important it is before we're through. So dear Lord, we thank you for each and every one that's come this way today. God, we appreciate these precious people. And I pray that they'd realize that you love them. And God, help them to realize that Jesus Christ has bought and paid for their redemption. And you offer to them a perfect Savior, a perfect salvation, a perfect righteousness that will clothe them and make them fit for the very presence of God. And Lord, we thank you that you so loved the world. You gave your only begotten Son that he made a complete and a final sacrifice for sin on Calvary's cross. And now salvation is offered to us as a free gift. So Lord, thank you for these things. And help us, give us illumination of the Scriptures and help us to see the importance of these things that are before us today. God grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I have an article here from Amnesty International, and their job is to keep up with torture and the abuse of human rights around the world and the persecution of Christians. And they say that the horrors of torture and the political detention are everyday incidents in fully one-third of the world's countries. And they talk about how that sometimes people are assaulted, they burn their flesh with cigarettes, and they use electric shock, or they make them go blindfolded for a year at the time in total darkness, or they're stretched upon the rack and their whole body is pulled apart more or less, I mean, the joints are, are broken, and, and all sorts of torture. And, and I look out across the world and there's hatred, there's divorce, there's crime, there's war, there's famines, there's death, death, uh, defamation and desecration. And uh, we have these horrendous things that like happened on the Gulf Coast, uh, on the Gulf Coast uh, recently. And, and there, there's murder, there's war, and there's starving kids and mothers on television. Sometimes you see uh, them carrying their starving babies with their ribs showing and their uh, <coughs> belly all swollen up the way they do when they're starving to death. And you begin to think, well, what in the world is wrong with this world? If God is a God of love, how can these things be? How can a God of love tolerate torture and murder and war? And there's war and famine and devastation everywhere. Or some sort of uh, catastrophe happening everywhere. And you think, well, what's wrong with my kids? I correct them, I spank them, I love them, I try to teach them, I tell them over and over and over, they still do wrong. And why is it that human nature takes to wrong just like a duck takes to the water? Well, if you read the Bible, and there was no chapter 3 of Genesis, you read that God created man and created creation and says, this is good. And you keep on reading the Bible, but skip Genesis chapter 3, and Cain kills Abel. The world gets so bad in the days of Noah, a few chapters over, that he has to destroy the whole world. He rains fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And everything is chaos. What's wrong? Well, the answer is given in Genesis chapter 3. The only way you'll understand the world situation, the only way you'll understand the news, the only way you'll understand yourself and your very nature, your kids, is to understand what happened in Genesis chapter 3. There's no other explanation, evolution, of the political world, or nobody else can give the explanation for what's wrong with the world today 
Why the chaos and the misery? And everybody's dying. We're getting sick. We're getting old. We're dying. Everybody's dying. Why? There's one, only one explanation. And that's in Genesis chapter 3 that man rebelled against God and plunged the world and the human race into sin. This is the entry of sin to the human race, not the first sin. Lucifer committed that sometimes before when he rebelled against God. And heaven, that's recorded in Genesis, or rather recorded in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, gives the fall of Satan. But this is the way that sin entered the human race. And people say, and while I'm talking, I want you to turn to uh, Romans chapter 5. I'm glad that we've got an inspired interpretation of Genesis chapter 3 in the Bible because so many people say, well, it's just a myth. This story of Adam and Eve is not real. It's just an allegory. I'll tell you one thing. My sickness, my hard work, and my sweat is real. When death comes, it's real. The plagues that God put upon the earth as a result of man's sin are real. And I assure you that what happened in Genesis chapter 3 is real and literal. These curses are literal and the effects are literal. And Adam and Eve were actual people that God created and they rebelled against God and disobeyed God and brought sin and death and the curse upon the entire human race in Romans chapter 8 and other places that tells us that the whole creation is groaning in pain until now. What's wrong uh, with the weather? Because the whole creation is cursed. That's what's wrong with the weather. That's the reason why it's hot in one place and cold in another. One place they're having so much rain they're flooded. Another place is having a drought. What's wrong with the human race? Why have you got so many ugly people? Have you ever been to Walmart or somewhere and just sit back while your wife is shopping, spending your money, and just look at people? Most of us are overweight and ugly. I don't believe Adam and Eve were all that bad looking. No, God made them perfect. He couldn't have said they were very good if Adam was 200 pounds overweight and Eve was ugly as a mud fence. Uh, yeah. But they were beautiful people. But something has happened. In Romans chapter 5, Paul explains when Adam ate that forbidden fruit, he plunged the world into a curse and into sin. And well, let's read Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death as a result, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned, that is, all sinned in Adam. And drop down and read uh, with me verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. And it was through Adam, you know, uh, for uh, many years, 2,000 years, they didn't have a law. People were not breaking the law. And that was not bringing death to them because they broke God's law. But it was because of Adam's sin that death passed upon all men. The reason why you're aging, the reason why you're going to die is because of Adam's sin. Through this one man, Adam, sin caused death to every human being that ever has lived. And not on that, but in verse 18, Romans 5, 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon how many people? All men to condemnation. In other words, we're condemned through Adam's transgression. And verse uh, 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. He's showing that through uh, Adam's one person, all this devastation has come upon the human race. But it's also showing that through Jesus Christ, God's gift of salvation, God's gift of righteousness come to you through him. One person. How can one person do it? Well, one person calls it all, and one person has lifted us and delivered us from the curse of sin. I hope you get the impact of this. 
What I'm saying, what God is saying in Romans chapter 5 is you're going to hell because Adam sinned in the garden. You don't have to kill anybody. You don't even have to break the Ten Commandments, although you break every commandment God ever made. Every commandment in the Bible, you break it, and I can show you that at another time when I've got time. But every commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I mean, you, you don't always put God first. You haven't put God first all your life. You've broken that commandment. And every other one that God made, you've broken that. But you don't have to break a commandment to be lost. What have you got to do to go to hell? Be born into the human family. Be a descendant of Adam and Eve. All sinned in Adam. When Adam sinned, you sinned. And he brought judgment and he brought condemnation upon the entire human race. That's what the Bible just said. You're lost. If you don't accept, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to burn in hell forever and ever. What have you got to do to be lost? Just be born in the human race. All people are born lost. They're born in sin as a result of Adam's sin. You say it's not fair. Well, whether it's fair or not. It doesn't seem fair. Somebody's born, you know, an invalid and they'll never get out of the wheelchair or they're born with cerebral palsy or with, uh, some people are born with arthritis or these crack babies are born with a habit that they're not responsible for. But the fact of the matter is, if you are born in a family and the father is a drunkard, you're going to suffer for it. It's not your fault. You didn't ask to be born. And probably if you had, we'd have said No. If you had asked to be born, we might would have said no. Anyway, you didn't ask to be born. It's not your fault. But I asked you, is it possible for a child to be born in a drunkard's family and he not suffer for that that he's not responsible for, is it? It's not possible, is it? Say amen. amen. Suppose you're on the plane. You're flying to Kalamazoo. And the pilot makes a bad mistake. And the plane crashes, and you're going down. Death is inevitable. You say, well, it's not my fault. I didn't make a mistake. He made a mistake. But you're going to be just as dead as the rest of them. If the president or if the Supreme Court makes a mistake in judgment, then we that are under him, we have to suffer the consequences, you see. And that's the way it is with the human race. Adam was the head of the human race. He made a terrible mistake. He disobeyed God. There's no reason for it. It's just his stubbornness and failure to listen. And we have to suffer as a result of that. I'm glad Genesis chapter 3 is in the Bible. We, we see some things here about the devil. We see some things about Adam and Eve and the fall of man, what theologians call the fall of man. And this is so important. We see, first of all, in Genesis chapter 3, that the serpent comes on the scene, and, and this serpent starts talking. That's unusual, and evidently there's been some sort of change in the serpent since that uh, uh, case there. Uh, God, put a case, uh, God put a curse upon the serpent in verse 14. Some people think that the serpent had legs and uh, that the serpent could talk. But the serpent is talking here. But there's never been any fossils found of serpents that had legs. And, but that doesn't mean it wasn't such a thing necessarily. But anyway, the devil didn't come up and say, Hey, I'm the devil. I came to tempt you, Adam and Eve, and I'm, I'm, I'm out to get you. The devil never comes in his own person. He's more subtle than that. He used a snake. And really, Satan is not even mentioned by name in this whole chapter. Because, see, you need to learn that the devil does not appear in his own person. He don't walk up to you and say, I'm the devil. I'm going to give you a hard time today. Watch out for me because I'm after you, buddy. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He might use some good-looking woman or some handsome man. He might use the television. He might use dope. He might use alcohol. He might use liquor. He might use anything. But you won't even know he's working. In fact, as people here today, the devil has got them hook, line, and sinker. They're children of the devil. 
The Bible talks about children of God and children of the devil. There's two categories of people in the world, uh, uh, like in 1 John 3, verse 12, I believe it is, or in Matthew 13, when the tares are sown in the, in the uh, field along with the wheat, Jesus said they are children of the wicked one. And there's probably people here today that are children of the devil, and they wouldn't believe it if you told them because the devil is so shrewd. He uses things that are more or less natural, that appeal, and he comes to you and makes them beautiful and attractive, and you don't even know he's working, and he's got you. Most of the human race is following Satan. He's the God of this world. And the broadest the road that leads to destruction, many of the be that go in direct. You, uh, you might be on the way to hell and not even know it. You could be lost and not know it. Yeah, but preacher, I'm sincere in what I believe. Well, you could be sincerely wrong. And the devil attacked Eve while Adam was not there. He attacked the woman because the woman was more easily fooled. And I'll prove that in a minute, so don't throw nothing at me in the meantime. <laughs> the woman probably was more inquisitive, and she's more easily led. At least she was fooled, and Adam was not fooled. But the devil knew that, and most salesmen had rather talked to the woman than the man. And I've asked some of them about that. And the devil tempted from without. Now, God wants to come into your heart and change you from within without. He works from within to without. But the devil attempts you through uh, what you see and what appeals to your uh, fleshly appetites. And notice he began by questioning God's words. The first recorded words of Satan are putting a question mark on the Word of God. Genesis 3, verse 1, I'll read again. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yes, has God said. Has God really said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? And he begins just by questioning God's Word, just like he does today. There's doubts in some of your mind about the Bible, whether it's really the inspired Word of God, whether you really can believe the Bible or not. Is it translated right? Is it full of mistakes? Or what about, you know, stories like Jonah and the whale? Uh, well, Jesus believed it, and whether you do or not, in Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus believed about Jonah and the whale. And the things that we question today, did God really rain fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah? But Jesus said that God did in Luke chapter 17 and told you to remember Lot's wife because she was turned uh, into a pill of salt. Uh, but, but the favorite things that people question today, Jesus put his stamp of approval upon, and he says the Scriptures cannot be broken, and he approved of the Bible, the Old Testament, even the things that are doubted today. And he believed the creation. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And so, but, but uh, uh, the devil wants you to doubt God's word. Does God really mean that salvation is a free gift that you can get it just for the asking? Most religions don't even believe that. But it's what the Bible teaches. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. You mean it's all that simple that Jesus did it all? There's nothing for me to do? Now, if you call upon the Lord and you get saved, it might lead to martyrdom and death. It might lead to most anything. But it's just as simple as falling off for a slippery log. Just turn to Jesus, trust Christ, and you'll be saved. Uh, but, but people will put a question mark beside of God's Word, especially when it comes to certain subjects. You want to mention some subjects that you question? How about tithing? How about wives submit yourselves to your own husband? And, and, and while I'm talking, somebody's whispering you in your ear, does God really mean that? Yea, hath God said that? And by the way, we need to study the tactics of the devil 
Because he still uses the same one after 6,000 years. You know why? Because they work. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the devil's tactics have worked. He's very highly successful. The most of the human race have followed him, and, and you might have been listening to it more than you think. But the first recorded words in the Bible of the devil are he's questioning God's words. Uh, he's questioning God's word. He wants you to doubt the Bible because if you'll stand firm on the word of God, then you'll be all right. And then he just called God a liar. In verse uh, 4, after the woman agreed that God said, don't eat that tree, the devil said, well, you'll not surely die. The devil knew better than that, but the devil is a liar from the beginning. And so he contradicts his own, uh, contradicts God's word and substitutes his own word. You'll not surely die. And it made it sound like in verse 5 that God was holding out on it. For God knows that the day you eat that tree, your eyes be open. God don't want you to be eyes. He, wants you, he don't want your eyes to be open. He wants you to uh, be in ignorance. He don't want you to be a God like him. He says your eyes be open, you'll be like God's, knowing good and evil. By the way, the New Age movement teaches that, you know, you, you can become like God or that you are God. And Shirley McLean uh, goes out sometimes outdoors or on the beach, and she says, I'm God, I'm God. And she's a stupid nut, what she actually is, but she thinks she's God. And a lot of people think that they're God. And the Mormons teach that you can evolve and become a god and have your own little universe in the future. If you can reach the seventh heaven. And so the devil's up to the same old tricks. Because human beings still follow him. By the way, we, we know a whole lot more than Adam and Eve. God said to Adam, said, now you'll surely die. Adam had never seen a dead animal. Adam had never seen death. He didn't know what death was. He didn't know what, who Satan was, evidently. Hey, but you know. The Bible has a lot about Satan and says he's a liar from the beginning. He's a murderer. And don't listen to him. But yet we listen to him. And so what the devil does, he comes and he... Uh, question God's, God's word, and then he contradicts God's word, and it makes it sound like that God's withholding stuff from you. And for, let me read verse 5 again. God doesn't know. God knows that the day you eat that forbidden fruit, your eyes are going to be open. He don't want your eyes to be open. He wants you to be in ignorance, see? And you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And God's holding back on you. And God don't really love you. If he did, he'd let you eat that fruit because it's good. And your eyes would be open and you'd be better off. That's what the devil is saying. Just like the devil tells us today, if, if God really loved you, things wouldn't be like they are. If there was a God of love, the world wouldn't be in the situation it's in. I've talked to a number of people that just looked out in the world and said it can't be a God. I, I'm an atheist because if there was a God... The world wouldn't be in this terrible shape it's in. If they just read the Bible, they know why the world's in the shape it's in. But listen, you can't look out in the world and read the newspaper. There's no way you can look out in the world and study what's happening in the world today and conclude that God is good and he's a God of love. All right, listen, the only place you find out that God is a God of love is in 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. And without the Bible, you don't know who God is or what kind of person he is. You don't know that God loves you. You don't know that Christ died for you. You don't know that God's a God of love. You cannot look out in this cursed creation and conclude that God is God of love. Is that right? Say amen. The only way you find it out is from the Bible. And if you believe that part of the Bible, you should believe all the Bible. One time a person told me, well, I don't believe the Bible. I said, yes, you do. 
The Bible tells in the book of Proverbs that the churn of milk brings forth butter and the ringing of the nose brings forth blood. I said, you don't believe if I ring your nose it'll bring blood? If you don't, I can prove it. But you do believe the Bible. Maybe you just believe the part you want to believe. And the part you don't want to believe, you don't believe. You want to believe that God's a God of love, but you don't want to read Genesis chapter 3 that I'm condemned because of Adam's sin. But the devil wants you to question God's word. And he wants you to believe that God's holding out on you, that uh, you know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. God's just restricting you. But that's not the case. God gives you these laws for your own benefit. God is a God of love, and everything he does is for your benefit. But I want to move on. I want also to look uh, briefly. It's going to, be, have to have to be brief according to my watch. Uh, at uh, Eve's part in this sin. Uh, you notice now in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, it talks about the woman and how she talked and parlayed with the devil. But you don't suppose to, uh, you're not supposed to argue with the devil. Eve's first mistake is she was too close to the tree. The Bible tells us flee temptation. Flee fornication. Lead us not into temptation. Get away from the temptation. If you stay away from temptation, you won't have to worry about the sin. In fact, I'm going to flip over to the book of Proverbs and read a, a verse, a passage. In Proverbs 4, verse 14, it tells us how to deal with sin. Proverbs 4, verse 14, Enter not to the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of the evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Now, stay clear of it. I know of one man that uh, was a drunkard or alcoholic, if you prefer that term, and uh, when he drove to work every morning, passed by a bar he used to attend and used to patronize, and it bothered him. It tempted him to stop. So he just started going to work a different way where he wouldn't pass that bar. Now, that's the Bible way. Don't enter that place that tempts you. Go not in the way of the wicked. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Pass away from it. Stay away from it. That's the Bible way. Have no fellowship with unfruitful workers of darkness, but rather approve them. And Eve's first mistake was she was too close to the tree. She was admiring its beauty. I mean, because she looked and she saw that the tree was beautiful. It was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes in verse 6. And so uh, she's looking. She's, she's there and she's talking. Don't talk with the devil. The Bible says submit yourself to God and resist the devil. The Bible way is not to bind the devil, not to talk with the devil, not to argue with the devil. The Bible way in James 4, 7 is to submit yourself to God and then resist the devil. Say, get away from here, Satan. Just do like Jesus did when the devil tempted him. He stood on the word of God and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Or it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Each time he quoted the scripture to the devil, he stood on the word of God and resisted the devil. That's the Bible way. But notice that Eve tampered with the word of God. She changed the word of God. In verse uh, 2, the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now, she left out two words. God says you can freely eat of every tree. She left out the word freely and every. Maybe that's no big deal to you, but I think every word is as significant here that she's tampering with the word of God. And in verse 3, she continues that. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, God didn't say anything about touching it. If you turn back to Genesis 2, 17, you'll see God said you can freely eat of every tree, and if you eat of it, you'll surely die. But she said, lest you die, she toned it down. 
and added to the word of God, neither shall you touch it. Now, we, we need to stand on the word of God just like it's written and not tamper. You know, the Bible says don't add to it, don't take away from the word of God. And Eve made that terrible mistake uh, of, of changing the word of God. She left out part of it. She uh, uh, deleted part of it, and then she added to it, and then she toned it down. And then verse 6 says, she, when she, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and her tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So she ate the fruit. And then, all right, listen, she became the tempter. The devil didn't tempt Adam. Eve tempted Adam. And I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. You know, uh, in Genesis 3, verse 12, where it's, uh, when God came, he said, Adam, have you eaten of this tree? And he said, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit of that tree, and I did eat. But it was the woman. And when God cursed the ground, he said, because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife. Eve was fooled by Satan, and then she tempted her husband to eat of the tree. Uh, turn with us to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, no, no, I said chapter 5, me, uh, chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Let's read verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. Do you see that? Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so uh, Adam evidently ate so he could be with his wife. He was not fooled. The devil didn't fool him. But God held him responsible. It's always in the Bible. It never says because of Eve's sin, death came to the world. It's because of Adam's sin. By one man, not one woman, but by one man, sin into the world. Because he's the head, he's responsible. And I wonder sometimes how much God holds us as men accountable for the condition of our family. We're the head of the family. Yeah, but preacher, this is the modern day. This, this is the modern day in 2005. How do you say man is head of the family? That's what the Bible still teaches. It doesn't matter what year you live in or when you live. The Bible is still the Word of God and still has the authority. And so Adam was not deceived. You see, uh, the whole thing is that Adam and Eve are a picture of Christ and the church. Adam was asleep when Eve was created. And Christ, it was during his death and because of his death. And while he was dead, by the way, the soldier pierced his side, the same place that Eve came from. Because... Uh, Adam and Eve are a picture of Christ and the church. The Bible explains that in many places. And Adam was asleep when Eve was formed, and Christ, uh, through his death, is what made it possible for us to be part of the church, the body of Christ, made up of all born-again believers. And just like Eve was partaker of Adam's nature, we are partakers of the divine nature. Isn't it a, a wonderful, glorious thing, an amazing thing, that we as God's people have him living in our heart, and we're partakers of the divine nature of God. What makes Christian people different is God lives inside of us. And therefore, the world can, cannot understand us. But it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, just as Adam loved Eve, Christ loves the church. And just like Adam chose to sin and eat the forbidden fruit, not because he was deceived, because he was not deceived. 
Why did he eat it in? Evidently so he could be with his wife. And Jesus became sin. He knew no sin. But he became sin for us so we could be saved. And he could have fellowship with us throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It's all a picture of Christ and the church, I think. And so uh, remember the lessons that we are, are looking at today. And I think one of them would be make sure you believe and you stand on the Word of God. You resist the devil because sin is worse than what you think it is. It never entered Adam's mind, not in his wildest imaginations, how terrible it was to disobey God. He never thought about here in this modern day, there's billions of people, billions of people dying, people being lost, people condemned because of him eating the forbidden fruit. He never saw the far-reaching results of how bad it would be. And I think sin is a whole lot worse than we ever could imagine how. I think it's worse than we could, we, we could even imagine. It has eternal consequences. I mean, does the Bible teach eternal punishment? Yes, it does. Because sin has... Not only consequences 6,000 years later from Adam and Eve, but right on throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. The consequence of it will be felt millions of years from now. Sin is worse than what you think it is. It pays to obey God and do exactly what God says in the Bible and not add to it, not take from it, don't tone it down. Don't listen to the devil. Just follow God's word. Stay away from evil. Let's all stand for just a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for Genesis chapter 3 and the explanations you've given us from the word of God. It helps us to understand.